Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We don't want anybody living in torment anymore. And that's why God has given to us the good news to go everywhere and preach the gospel and set people free from the things that would torment them. But God's got to have a people who know him in order to do that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Many people have come into the kingdom and they've, or at least they sought to keep, come into the kingdom, but the gate was too narrow and the way was too narrow. But somehow there's been room and accommodation made for them and there is a wrong witness and expression. You may be seated. Huh. And here tonight we're here to clear up some things for you. We're here to clear up some things concerning God's will for your life. We hear in the mighty name of Jesus, hallelujah, to participate with the Holy Spirit, to see everything made new in your life. Isn't that good news? Hallelujah. Have everything made new? We're here to announce to you this glorious good news that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. Everything old has passed away, and behold, all things are new. And all things are of God. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it amazing? It's amazing. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let me read a couple of verses of Scripture to you. You can open your Bibles at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. I don't want you to be very mindful of listening to what I have to say by the Spirit of the Lord so that everything about your life can be challenged and corrected in Jesus' name. Because you're standing and sitting in, in the holies of holies right now, whether you realize it or not, you're in the most sacred realm that exists in the universe, been given this access by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit. You once were darkness. Are you reading it? Yeah. Some people would think that I just say this out of my own mind sometimes. I want, that's why it's important for me to make sure that I point you to the verse of Scripture. You once were darkness. Darkness is not just a realm. It is a realm, but it is also a state of being. You once were darkness. See that? It's a state of being. Doesn't say there in that verse of Scripture as it does in other places that we were under the control or the authority of the spirit of darkness. It says, you once were darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Ha! Ah, wow! Walk as children of the light. God is the father of light in whose there is no variableness nor shadow in turning. He is unchanging. He's immutable. He does not diminish. He doesn't cease for a second. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Woo! And I've been begotten of him. And you've been begotten of him. The father of lights. Jesus came into the world as the light of the world. And I believe it's Matthew 5, 17. He says, you are the light of the world. What a responsibility. 14, verse 14, in Matthew 5, 14. <laughs> Somebody said, why are you speaking in tongues in church? So I can remember the verses. Uh, so I can remember where I'm at in the... Get on the right page with the Holy Spirit and speak as an oracle of God, not after just something that I organized or fashioned out of my own mind. The Holy Ghost comes and He gives to us the ability to speak on the behalf of the living God. And now I'm telling you right now, I... I'm the first to say I certainly have no sufficiency of myself or ability within myself to ever think that I could speak on behalf of God. <laughs> I need some help here. Paul said in 1 Corinthians in chapter 14 and verse 6 says, if we come to you speaking in tongues, we shall also come not only speaking to you in tongues, hallelujah, but also we come speaking to you by revelation, by knowledge, by prophecy, and by doctrine. That's just weird. I'm just going to follow Paul. He followed Jesus. He followed Jesus so well, the Lord said, just write all that down. 
Just write all that down. That's, you've got it right. That's it. Write it all down right there. See, Paul discovered a walk with Christ Jesus on the road to Damascus. Hallelujah. That every day he grew in. Hallelujah. And every day he developed it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Thou changest not your compassions. They fail not. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Oh, great is thy faithfulness. Lord, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. As thou hast been, Forever you shall continually be. Great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, all I have needed, thy hands have provided. Oh, great is thy faithfulness. Oh, great is thy faithfulness, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that every one of you people come to re recognize, realize how good you are, how wonderful it is to dwell in fellowship with you, how easy it is to do the right thing and refuse the wrong, to do the good and eschew the evil. How wonderful it is to live life in you rather than to choose death. Father, I pray in Jesus' mighty name that your church would begin to shine with the glory of your brightness and the glory of your life. That they would rise and shine for truly our light has come. Truly your glory has risen upon us. In Southern California and San Diego and the nation of the United States of America, is in desperate need of seeing again this great outpouring of your love, this great outpouring of your grace, this great outpouring of your goodness. As in times past they saw, and men beheld your glory, and in awe of the display of your love came rushing into the kingdom. Father, we pray it to begin as it was, but even greater in the 60s, when suddenly... The moving of your spirit captivated the hearts of a generation. And tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people began to line up at the door of the churches, hungry for the moving of the spirit of the living God. Father, we pray again in this nation, the great outpouring of your grace would take a hold first and foremost in the hearts of your people. That those who know you will give you place Come rain, everyone will come to understand. Oh, great is thy faithfulness. 
Lord, great is thy faithfulness. A morning by morning, new mercies we see. You change is not thy compassion, they fail not. And as you have been, you shall forever continue to be. Hallelujah. It's so wonderful to just recognize that such a wonderful and loving and merciful God could be that unchanging, that glorious, that faithful, that merciful. Thank you, living God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, I want you to look back in and with me again in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8, and I want you to understand a couple of things here. First and foremost, we have an exhortation by Paul to have absolutely nothing to do with the things that are in this world, that are, that are belonging to the things of darkness, that are belonging to the things of sin. I will remind you of what the Lord Jesus said in Revelation chapter 21, and I, begin, I believe it begins with verse 10 and then goes on to verse 11. He says, He that overcomes shall inherit all things. That's pretty wonderful, huh? And that's not only, that is not only in the future, but it is right now. There is an inheritance for us right now. There is no way that you and I can be the light of the world. There's no way that you and I can be a testi testimony of God's loving kindness and tender mercies of His rescue and redeeming love, unless we're shining with His, with His goodness and shining with His presence. And so when we're willing to walk in the Spirit, when we're willing to follow the Holy Ghost, when we're willing to be obedient to God, then the light of His glory shines in our, our life. But when we give place to the powers of darkness, we've got to recognize that we're not inheriting all things. We look at the, the clear distinction in Revelation chapter 2. 21, verse 10 and 11, verse 7 and 8, thank you, verse 7 and 8, he that overcomes, and I'm, I'm telling you, there's no question in my mind as to John's urgency to help people understand their need to overcome, it was, it was an urgency within John's life and in his message, they help people understand the difference between truth and lie, between darkness and light. He was given the revelation. He's the one who saw on the Isle of Patmos all the things that were going to come down from the realm of darkness and from the realm of the satanic. And he wanted us to be certain that we knew who we were and that we stood on the truth and in the truth lest we should be deceived. And so you look at his writings, especially in first, his first epistle of John. But not only there... Also in the Gospel of John, second and third epistle of John. And then in his warnings, also as Christ Jesus spoke to him and he wrote him down in the Revelation chapter 2 and verse 3, and chapter 2 and chapter 3, concerning the overcomer. He that overcomes, the Lord, he said, Christ Jesus said, He that overcomes, will I grant to sit down with me in my throne, even as I sat down with my Father in his throne. He that overcomes, I will give to him a new name that only he knows. He that overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the house of my God. He should never go out anymore. He that overcomes should be worthy to be, to, to be clothed in white raiment. He that overcomes. What a wonderful privilege. What a blessing to have the ability to overcome. And in 1 John chapter 5, he says, This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. This faith that is in Christ Jesus, this transforming faith. A faith that made us a new creation. A faith that brought us into a place of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Of being able to know God and walk with God. Have the nature of God. Have our spirits joined unto God. We hear as Paul ministers to us about all the lust of the flesh and all the lust of the eye. And all the pride of life as he breaks it down into descriptive terms and 
Ephesians chapter 5 and says, that can't have any place in your life. Don't be deceived. Don't let anybody deceive you. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. A message that's over and again heard in the epistle of John. Especially the first epistle. There come in the last days people who do signs and wonders and say that the Christ is here and say, and, 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 you know, profess to be prophets. And, but they turn people's hearts away from the living God. Anybody who's doing anything in the name of Christ Jesus, that they're not bringing you to a place of consecration, a place of sanctification, a place of purity, a place of holiness, a place of living in the nature and the ways of God. There's error in their life. Be certain of this. God demands that we be an overcomer. That we overcome all those things which are in the world. All those things which are the influence of demon spirits and the powers of darkness. Be certain of this. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be your God and you will be my son. But he says without, outside of this relationship, outside of this place, there is every abominable thing. There is every unclean thing. There is everything my soul abhors. He says outside of this place, without, on the outside, separated in that realm of darkness, in that place where demon spirits occupy the hearts of men, there are the porneos, which King James translated whoremongers. But sexual immorality rules, and I'm telling you, Satan has invaded humanity with pornographic things and sexual immorality. We were reading a professor from, I believe the professor um, was from University of Pennsylvania, feminist. She said, in our culture, in our society, young men are demasculated by the time they go into first grade. Our society has no place for men to be leaders anymore. There is, there is, there is no clear distinction between gender Roles have been completely switched. It's pretty radical for a feminist to be saying those kinds of things. She was describing in, a, in, in, in the most profane sense the condition of our culture, but it was something that she was boasting in. A life turned upside down because God's people are not moving in the authority of Jesus Christ. They've abdicated. They've been consumed with self-interest. They've been overwhelmed with their own discouragement. They've listened too, mu too much to the voice of the enemy. They live too much in the realms of darkness. God says, you're not darkness anymore. You're light. Walk, therefore, as children of light. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city set upon an eel that cannot. Be hid. But we must be careful lest somehow we've lost our savor. Somehow we're not salty anymore. Somehow we don't make people thirsty anymore for the kingdom of God and for the things concerning righteousness. The things concerning the heavenly life. We somehow we got to make sure that the light that is in us is not darkness. For if the light that is in us be darkness, how great is the darkness? That's what the message of Jesus Paul warns us there. He warns us very clearly in Ephesians. He tells us all of those things that belong to a realm of porneos, of sexual immorality, of uncleanness, of that which God's soul abhors. The Lord says, and without are the sorcerers, and, and those are those folks who are it's really a word that is used. We derive our modern day word for pharmacopoeia or pharmacy from this word that is translated sorcery is to be enticed or to make enchantments with the drugs. Colorado now has passed a bill and it's been legalized to sell marijuana as an introductory drug so that now, or I mean, forgive me, as yeah, an introductory drug too. There's a recreational drug, it's an introductory drug to more drugs. People don't realize, they just think that they're just 
living in a, a world of no consequence and they're going to partake of something that is going to give them a stimulus, some kind of a feeling and a sensation, and there's going to be no reper repercussions, and it has nothing to do with the spiritual realm around them. But in reality, they've opened up their soul, they've opened up their life to demon spirits. Huh. I believe the Vatican sent out a report just the other day saying there is more people seeking to be delivered from tormenting evil spirits than they've, than they've seen in modern times. People have gotten involved in various forms of witchcraft and various forms of the occult, especially as Harry Potter and all these other things have come along through the media, um, making witchcraft and making various different forms of s Satan worship somehow appealing, glorifying that realm. And what happened is people unknowingly opened themselves up to the powers of darkness and demon spirits came in to occupy them with, in force. <laughs> Why? Because the church is the hinder of lawlessness has not taken its place and stood up in divine glory. They've allowed too much demon activity in their life through all the sin and the iniquity that belongs to the realm of darkness. And Paul warns us right there in Ephesians chapter 5 and 8 after he describes the darkness he says you are no longer, you once were darkness but you're not anymore, you light. Walk as children of the light. When we look over in Peter's warning in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and verse 11, I want you to go there with me and, and please look at this verse of Scripture. I want you to remember these things. The Lord says to us, He says, give full, He says, Rather, brethren, give diligence to making your calling and election certain. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. And the things that he's talking about that we need to be doing is being mindful and giving our attention to continually walking in the virtues of the Holy Spirit. Walking in the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Walking in the realms of that which is ministered to us by the Spirit of holiness. He says, give all diligence to making your calling and election certain. Somebody said, I thought it was already a foregone conclusion. Well, not according to what Peter just said. He said, give all diligence to making your calling and election certain. Because God has given to us the most wonderful, the most valuable, the most meaningful, the most glorious life, the greatest thing, the greatest opportunity. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. What riches... And now, oh, there's got to be a reality that strikes our heart. But these are more important things than any possible thing that we could give our lives to. Someone was telling me the other day, they said, Well, you know, I wanted to learn how to play the piano. And I started playing about 15 minutes a day. And I got out about that much. And I said, You're not going to get a breakthrough that way. He says, You're right. He said, I gave up. He said, it just wasn't coming to me. He said, but my wife, she took it up and she was doing it about two or three hours a day. I said, ah, she's playing now, isn't she? You'll get a breakthrough two to three hours a day. The same way goes with prayer. The same way, same thing goes with your attendance to these things that God has given to us of the riches of his nature, the riches of his life. Satan doesn't have the life against popular opinion. Satan doesn't have the good time. It belongs in the presence of the Lord at the right hand of His majesty in that place that lasts forever in that goodness of God in those things that, that the world rolls their eyes at and cannot understand. You have to have a change of heart to begin to appreciate. Your hearts have been changed. You once were darkness, but now we're your light. Walk as children of the light. He said to us, He said if we do these things, He said then an entrance shall be ministered un, unto us abundantly, an entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And to understand this in the context of which Paul said it in uh, Colossians 1.13, he said, we've been translated out of the realm of darkness, out of the power of darkness, into the kingdom of the dear Son. But there's so many 
who have just fa who failed to go on to know the Lord. They've been distracted with earthly interests, with the cares of this life, with the deceitfulness of riches. When we go on and we recognize those things that are separated from God, that are not inheriting those things which, which Father has, we see that in that lineup in verse 8 of Revelation 21, there's also the idolater there. Covetousness is the same as idolatry. There are many idols, modern day idols, that people have set up in their own self-interest things that they made more important than serving God and obeying Christ Jesus and walking in the Spirit. And you and I are going to have to deal with the reality of where we stand with God. He says those that overcome. He's talking about the world. He's talking about the spirit of the world. He's talking about the lust of the flesh. He's talking about the lust of the eye. He's talking about the pride of life. Those that overcome demon influence. I write unto you, young man, John said, because you're strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. God has given to us that place. As the church, we are supposed to be, as Paul said to the Thess church at Thessalonia, we are supposed to be the hinderer of iniquity. He writes that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're supposed to be the hinderer of iniquity. Those who stand back, to hold back, rather, that which Satan would do is in his design and purposes to, to bring men into a greater state of immorality and a greater state of hardness of heart and a greater bondage of iniquity. There's got, there has to be a moment in which we awaken out of our sleep. There has to be a moment in which we recognize that every time we give access to Satan to come and do his wicked works in our life. That we open up a door so that Satan can also flood into our generation, into the realms of our influence. We're not a hinderer. We're not holding back the forces of darkness. We're not those who overcome the wicked one. We're not executing authority over all the powers of Satan. We're not doing what Jesus told us to do, going casting out devils, having authority over every unclean spirit. Tread upon scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy. Somehow we're going to have to understand that God's called us to a place of consecration unto Him. A place where only the Holy Spirit can influence our heart, our attitudes and our emotions. Where no longer do demon spirits have the right to access us. We've got to deal with the fact that John knew something that we do not know. We have to deal with the fact that John knew something that we need to understand once again. And he writes in 1 John 5, 18, he said, everyone who is born of God does not sin. That's what he said. That's what he said. And boy, does that ever go over like a lead balloon. Everyone who is born of God does not sin. He keeps himself and the wicked one cannot touch him. What a glorious realm. That shouldn't be intimidating. That should be liberating. You should say, wow, there's a place I can walk with God where Satan cannot access me, where Satan cannot deceive me, where Satan cannot carry me away. There's a place where I can be led and guided into all truth and find ability to please Father in all things. Amen. Yes, there is. Amen. Yeah, there is. That's why Jesus suffered, bled, and died. That's why he bore our sins in his own body on the tree so that now we could be dead to sin and begin to live unto righteousness by whose wound we were healed. What a grace. But I'm telling you, we live in a day and a time and a period where seducing spirits wax worse and worse. Where doctrines of devils take a hold of men's mind. And though the Bible is very clean and clear in the distinction Concerning those who know God and those who do not know God. Yet, we allow ourselves to be deceived. We ignore it. We're caught away with worldly cares and earthly interest. I want to go back for just a minute and, and look here in Ephesians 5 and just help you to see once again. I just want to describe this to you. Paul says in verses 1 and 2, he tell, tells us to be imitators of God as dear children. To walk in love as Christ also loved us. As he offered himself as a sweet smelling savor unto God, so you and I, and I'm going to add this, 
I'm going to jump to Romans 12, 1. So you and I are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, doing what is our reasonable service. Being not conformed to this world, but being transfigured by thinking different about ourselves. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Or you can translate it being renewed in the spirit of your mind if you understand what that means. But if in layman's turn, it simply means thinking different about yourself according to now, now what God describes you and I to be. Hallelujah. Uh, uh, people want to go all the time and march around with the statement somehow that Adam's sin and his disobedience has a greater impact upon our life than the obedience of Christ Jesus. But that's not what Paul said in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. He said that the obedience of Christ is abounded far more unto it, to it many, as many as would believe. Far more has it affected our lives than the disobedience of one by whom death came. I tell you, any doctrine that makes Satan stronger than God is a false doctrine. Any doctrine that makes the effect of Adam's disobedience greater than the effect of the obedience of Christ Jesus is false doctrine. I'm telling you, God wins every time. And everybody who puts their trust in Him will find themselves successful in the end. They'll hear Him say to the overcomer, Inherit all things. I give you all things freely to enjoy of my presence. Oh, should that not be a pearl of great price? Should that not be to us this treasure hid in the field? To be able to have, to know the living God. To know the living God. I mean, to know Him personally. We were discussing the other day about Mariah Woodworth Eder. She had lost many children. She was just a Catholic girl and she lost many children to disease. And having lost these children to disease, she turned in her suffering and in her agony to God to know the living God. She had been introduced to Jesus by some Pentecostals. And she began to lay hold on the things of the Spirit of the Lord. Now, you know, people get, go through hard times. They go through troubles, trouble, troubling times, situations of death and, and loss and they begin to blame God. <laughs> a lot of people turn that way. But she turned in her pain and her hurts to know God. To say, I want to know you, Lord. She laid hold of God in that desperation. And she came to know the living God in such a way that she had visiting rites in the heaven. One day they brought her a boy, a young boy. What's that, baby? A young boy, seven years old. It was, she said, the most insane person that she had ever seen. And of course, back in that day, in the, in the 20s, in the teens and in the 20s, this woman was having 20, 30, 40,000 people come to the meetings because the power and the glory of Jesus Christ was there. Somebody touched heaven. That's what happened. Somebody touched heaven. They brought her a young boy, a young boy seven years old, completely, totally mentally insane, blind, born blind, Born deaf, born mute. Mama Edda took him up in her arms and he was instantly made whole. He saw, he heard, he spoke. Completely a sound mind. That's why people came. Mama Edda was able to do that because she knew Jesus. Because she lived in heaven more than she lived in earth. <laughs> Father's looking for some people who will be translated into the kingdom of the dear son who will give all attendance to making their calling and election sure so he can minister to them an entrance into this realm that has been given to all men everywhere. Anybody can come with the blood of Jesus. You can actually come. You and I can actually come into the holies of holies. We don't have to sing out of pretense and false tense. We can begin to lift up our voice and say, Lord, I come to you into the holies of holies, the holiest place of all by the blood of Jesus Christ and have a literal experience that we truly have access to the throne of grace. Hallelujah. I have access into that realm. Paul made it so real. <laughs> he made it so real, you know. He said we're seated in a heavenly realm. We're seated right now in a heavenly realm in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. I've got something I want to minister to you here. and By the help and the grace of God, and getting it set up. And I was getting ready to launch in. And 
And the Lord said, no, just finish five here. He says to us, clearly, but fornication. Once again, that's that word porneas, same word translated whoremonger in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, translated fornication here, porneas. And yes, you're right to associate it with pornography. That is a demon stronghold that is designed by Satan himself to snare the souls of men. Because if I finish reading to you, the Lord says, continues on to go, those who overcome inherit all things, but without those who are not willing to overcome, those who continue to allow Satan to run over them and influence them, those who continue to participate with the realms of darkness, or with the realms of disobedience, he said, including all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. All you can say is, my, how is God grieved by sin? Oh my, how does sin so distress him? How does iniquity so affect him that he would create an eternal torture chamber to destroy it forever? Humanism says, nay, not so. A loving God would never do that. That's the voice of Satan. That's the voice of Satan. It's just like he cried out in Job saying, no man down there wants to serve you. None of mankind follow after you. They follow me. And basically his accusation, what are you going to do? God, kill us all? Listen to him. Father says, I have one man. I have my servant Job. He's perfect. God names three men perfect in the Old Testament. Three men perfect. True. And don't you tell Papa he ain't right. Just because somebody misquoted Jeremiah chapter 17, huh? Just because somebody misapplied Psalms chapter 5, according to how Paul applied it in Romans chapter 3, just because people misapplied what Isaiah said concerning an incurable wound of a rebellious people. Hello, that has nothing to do with you and me who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and filled with the Holy Ghost and been made a new creation, given a new heart and a new spirit, and he put his spirit on the inside of us. What are you going to believe? Are you going to believe men's report? Are you going to believe God's report? Are you going to believe what demon spirits say about you? Are you going to believe what Jesus Christ has pronounced? Who has believed our report? (laughs) To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He should grow up among us as a tender plant out of a dry ground. Hallelujah. Christ Jesus, the Messiah. Hallelujah. I understand this. Fornicators. Unclean people. Uncleanness. Covetousness. Let it not be once named among you that are saints. Hallelujah. You see that? Yes. Let me say it like this, because let me le- read it to you a little bit more in the distinct nature of the terminology used in the Greek language. Let it not be named among you who are holy ones. How many holy ones do I have in here tonight? I'm telling you, that's what God did for us. That's what he did for us. That's what he did for us. That's what Paul said he did for us. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 24, he said he recreated us in his image. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. And righteousness and true holiness. Uh, That's what I'm going with. That's what I'm going with. And he says, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, but rather continually giving of thanks. For you know... That nor, no porneous person, no whoremonger, the Lord just named it over there. Nor unclean person, nor covetous man, or idolater. Those are the things that are named there in Revelation 21. Eight, remember? Remember? Almost in that exact order. Has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God? Let no man deceive you. One of the things that Christ Jesus ministered, one of the things that Paul was earnest about and that John was most earnest about was deceptive, seducing spirits waxing worse and worse as we approach the day of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And many are swept away with it. People love the idea of taking all of their iniquity and walking into the church with it and somehow having an insurance policy and somehow having having a conscience cure for their sin and their iniquity. 
<laughs> no, sir. God delivered us from it. God delivered us out of the pains of death. God delivered us out of the power of sin and iniquity. God gave us the power to destroy all the works of Satan. Somebody's going to have to leave earth and start touching heaven. If we're going to see a revival in the church, if we're going to see a great awakening in this nation, somebody's going to have to start pressing in past all the things that would hinder us, all the strongholds of doubt and unbelief that would hold us back. All the yawns and disinterest. True. It's true. It's true. I'm just standing in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> talk about adrenaline. <laughs> you talk about getting shocked with a, with a life surge. <laughs> I pray in the name of Jesus that as we start the School of the Spirit this Friday... And we're going to start at 6 o'clock. We're going to start prayer. And at 7 o'clock, we'll start the ministry of the School of the Spirit. We're going to do it every other week. I pray that people will begin to take a hold of God. I, I love the story of how uh, Reinhard Bonnke is just a young man. And he was there on the floor during prayer time, during the altar time. And he's there on the floor. And he, he's just seeking God. And all of a sudden, he feels electricity going through his hands. The power of God surging through his hands. He's looking around Wondering where there is a short, where there is some kind of live wire open. He recognizes, no, there is nothing. And the Spirit of the Lord, he just got this electricity, this surge of electricity surging through his hands, up his arms. And the Lord speaks to him, go lay hands on this woman who was sick and had an infirmity, spirit of an infirmity for many years. And he's there basically arguing with God because Pop Bunky is in control of the meeting and nobody moves unless he gives permission and he's, and he's in it straight, you know, he's, he's caught between two intense, you know, powers. Dad, who's going to slap him if he gets out of line, or God is going to kill him with electrical surges if he don't obey. <laughs> so he snuck over and kept looking up at his dad, making sure his dad's head was still bowed, sneaks over, gets close to the woman, she looks up, dad's head's still bowed, so he stands up real quick, lays his hands on the woman, goes right back to his knees quickly. The woman lets out a yell and a scream, and she, and, and, and Pop Bunky says, what did Reinhardt do? She said, he laid hands on me, and the, uh, the power of God came through me, and this disease that is in my body left, and she went to shouting, and everybody was happy, and, bon and Reinhardt was, was very pleased, because he was off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. I want, I, want to, I want you to get in those kinds of prayer meetings. I want, you to get, I want you to decide that you're going to leave being influenced and being attracted to the things that demon spirits are doing because what they do is you understand they neutralize you through their iniquity. They take away your power and strip you of your inheritance when you participate with their activity. Somebody's going to have to start walking as light, as children of light. Somebody's going to have to start living in the heavenly realm, which Jesus Christ has translated us into, according to what Paul said in Colossians 1.13, an entrance that will be ministered to us abundantly, as Peter described it, if we give all attendance and all diligence to these things which have been provided to us in the grace of God, brought to us by our teacher, the Holy Ghost, who is supposed to be our master, by the way, Jesus said, I'm going to send you another master. I will send you another parakalitas. And that is a very difficult Greek word to translate. Because there's not a whole lot of information. So we got to just understand it. I will send you another parakalitas like me. So we've got to understand what Jesus was. And then recognize that he sent someone else to us just like him. To be to us what he was to the disciples. And he called him the Holy Ghost. Who would teach us all things. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And we'll have to get in the school of the Spirit, start taking our place in the body of Christ, start, start taking our, our place in our inheritance in Christ Jesus and walking out this wonderful and glorious life that has been given to us, which Paul modeled, turned the world upside down. How oh, One man went around and conquered the world for Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And anybody went with him, they, they, you know what? They also experienced the same. God did great things, I'm sure, through Peter and did great. He did, of course, we know he did through Peter. We know what Peter ministered. 
We know how Peter walked. Peter walked in such a heavenly realm that when he got, when people knew he was coming to town, they didn't have to send out flyers. They went and grabbed their sick and brought them into the street. Not so that necessary that Peter would pray for them or lay hands on them. Just his shadow was enough to take care of the disease. Come on. Come on. That'll change people's lives. People, we're not talking, we're not talking about growing big churches. We're talking about growing big people in the kingdom of God. We're talking about true maturity. We're talking about an inheritance, a place, a position that changes culture and society. When the light of God's glory begins to shine through our lives. Let no man deceive you. So I just want to read this. Let no man deceive you. Verse 6. With vain words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. You have to decide, are you a child of disobedience or are you a child of obedience? The child of disobedience, their state of being is darkness. Their state of existence is darkness. A child of obedience who's received the spirit of obedience, hallelujah, is a child in the state of light, a child of the light. Those who have been begotten of God, who have overcome the world. Now, I want you to recognize that the things that you think you know, and the things that you have settled out and believed about your life, are not necessarily so. And in fact, most of the things that you believe about yourself are not true at all. Many of them... And I, I could begin to possibly even put a percentage on them are nothing but lies and deception. I'm going to tell you this on the basis that only God's word is true. And only what God said is true. And what everybody else said is a lie. And I, I would say that if you believe about yourself everything that God said about you, then what you believe is true. But many people don't believe what God said about them. They believe what they're... they're their teachers said about them, what, what their parents said about them, what, what their friends or their enemies said about them, what the, what the demon spirits and the powers of darkness, the slander and the accuser places upon them. That's reality. When you begin to believe what God said about you, <laughs> When you begin to believe that God made you a new creation, He said, I've given you the same glory that the Father gave me, that I'm in you just like Father was, just like Father is in me. You begin to believe that about yourself. When you begin to hear the Lord say you're a new creation, created in righteousness and true holiness, you begin to believe that about yourself. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you know, Paul's talking about the glory that hit Moses. You know, the glory that hit Moses <laughs> was seen on Jesus in the, what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. You know? Yeah. Hallelujah. He began to light up with the presence and the glory of God so much so that his clothes began to light up. Huh? That's what the Scripture says, and I know it's true. I know it's true. I'm convinced that everything in the Bible is true. It's accurate. It may be contrary to Newtonian physics. It may be contrary to quantum mechanics. It may be contrary to every kind of interest and thought and imagination and idea and concept that men come up with. But I've, everything that you call reality is based upon what you believe to be true. What I believe to be true is the Word of God. And for me, that is reality and everything else is fiction. Everything else is a place of deception. Everything else is a place of illusion. Everything else is a place of influence by the God of this world. I'm telling you, if you don't realize it, the God of this world, the prince and the power of the atmosphere, saturates the experience of men. And Christ Jesus came to deliver us out of that realm and seat us in a place of divine glory so that you and I can understand what's really going on here. So we can begin to have a grip. Have a hold of reality. You know, Moses' face lit up with glory. And uh, Israel, he said Israel put a veil on him. Uh, put a parka over top of him. Huh? Hallelujah. Put a veil. Anybody got a scarf or something? Put a veil over top of him. Why? 
Because what was coming off of his face, Paul said, was the new covenant. What was coming off of his face was the, new, the, transla- the transition that would take place in the nature of men when Christ Jesus came. And they could not and are, were unwilling to look at that glory now being revealed through men. They were unwilling to accept such a relationship. And then he takes us to a place in verse 18. He says, and now we take the veil off. He now puts the veil on us. You see the transition? Go study that. And I'm not going to go into it right now, but go home and study 2 Corinthians chapter 3. There's a transition where all of a sudden the veil's on Moses to start with. And then, you know, a veil of deception is on Israel. And then all of a sudden the veil is on you and me. It's the veil that Moses had. And we take off the veil and we look in the mirror and we behold the glory of God. What are you going to believe about yourself? What are you going to believe? Listen to me. What are you going to believe? Are you going to believe that you've got to be sick? Are you going to believe that you've got to be diseased? Are you going to believe that you've got to sin every day? Are you going to believe that you're unrighteous? Are you going to believe that your heart is wicked and deceitful? And of course, Jeremiah didn't actually say that. People quote it. It's, it's sad. They quote something wrong and then misapply it. That is pretty delusional. First of all, I'm going to be the first to say that clearly there is evidence plenty and it is true to say that the unredeemed heart is wicked okay and that it is deceitful but Jeremiah didn't say that he said that the heart of man is frail and evasive he can't deal with anything concretely that's what he said in the Hebrew language that's what he said in the King James English I know he didn't say that are you listening to me I just I prefer to study the Hebrew language and read it that way and then I'm going to tell you and then you can, and there's plenty of applications and plenty of software these days. All you got to do is point and click. <laughs> you can find out whether I'm telling you the truth or not. Uh-huh. There's translations like Green's Little Translation. And that's a great, uh, J.P.'s translation is a great translation. Plenty of peer review, except across uh, denominational uh, expressions and, 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 and appreciated by all scholars. Great translation of the Bible. Green's literal translation. Be a good one for you to study. But dear people, I want you to grab a hold of the reality about what you believe. About the things that you think. and The thing that you process. Isaiah the prophet said, don't let this word of God depart out of your mouth. Continually speak it. Continually meditate upon these things. Continually declare these things. So that you can participate with that which God has purposed for you to do. The word of faith, Paul said, is nigh us even in our mouth. This is the word of, this is the gospel that we're preaching. These are the things that God's declared concerning who we are. What are you going to believe about yourself? Here's the word of God. I'm going to just let my hand represent the word of God. The influence of the word of God. The things that God says about you, the things that he describes. He says, he says, over here in the realms of this power and this authority, over here in the realms of Holy Ghost power, you can do anything. All things are possible to those that believe. He says, I tell you, I'll give you a power to walk on water. Man says, that's crazy. He said, I'll give you a power to raise the dead. Man says, that's crazy. <laughs> I'll give you power to cast out devils. Man says, that's crazier. I'll give you power to live in authority so that Satan cannot in any way touch you or access you. Uh, Christians say that's impossible. God declares to us in his word everything that is a reality and everything that is true. He lays out the bases of the whole world like this. The whole world, the whole foundation of everything is that men are either being influenced by satanic powers of darkness, by demon spirits sent out by fallen angels. Are they under the influence and mandate of the Holy Ghost and the power of the living God? It's one or the other. That's the way God lays it out. He doesn't make a neutral zone. He doesn't make a neutral zone of human experience. He doesn't make a neutral zone uh, of human creation. He says it's one or the other, darkness or light. He makes sure that everybody understands that everything that belongs to sin and everything that belongs to this world has nothing to do with Him. It has everything to do with the prince and power of the air, the powers of darkness, the spirit of disobedience that now works in the children of disobedience. 
When you begin to lay out the framework of your life and your existence and you make it that simple and you recognize that the only place of faith, the only place of life, the only place of authority is the Word of God, then you take a stand there and say, okay, this is who God says I am. This is what He has provided for me. This is what He said He would do and I'm not going to be moved. You have a clear demarcation in the battleground that you're now engaged on. You have a, you have a means to be successful in a war that's waged against you. Somebody said, I'm not in war. Well, I'll tell you right now, Satan's warring against you. <laughs> he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And I know Pentecostals like to say he's got his teeth pulled out. <laughs> and I'm stomping on his head. Well, that's all good. It's all fine. And I just hope that you're doing that. Because the bottom line of it is Satan's deceptive power is such that he was able to draw away, as is described in the book of Revelation, one-third of the angels that stood before the presence of God, beholding the glory of God and doing his bidding. If he, can, if he can be so effective in his deception against them, what would he do to you and me? Our only place of safety is the word of God. The name of the Lord is like a high tower. The righteous run in and they're safe. I'm going to stay safe. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, to have the cloud of God's glory upon our life, to have, I mean, you know, you look back in the book of Job and, you know, Satan says, well, you have a hedge around him and I can't touch him. Wow, what a walk of God, with God Job had. I mean, I'm telling you right now, we've got more than a hedge. We have a fire cloud of his glory. We baptized in the Holy Ghost. In the, we're living, in, baptized in the person of Jesus Christ. But the Lord leaves it to us to make a decision. He says, Paul said in Romans chapter 13, he said, put on or be endued. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ or be endued with the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust." You've got to understand where the battle rages. You've got to understand the deployment of satanic powers assigned against you. You've got to understand the weapons that he uses in the realms of sin and iniquity to take you out ultimately. And in the meantime, neutralize you. So you keep coming to church and repenting, keep coming to church and repenting, and you never go on into a place that God has made available for you to access in the holies of holies and stand there before the presence of God and come to know the living God, to have an insight, to have a revelation. Because I'm telling you, once you see this realm of heaven, you become more, you become more impacted now by the things of the Holy Ghost and earthly things. As long as you continue in this life with a, with a mentality that's all uh, about the things that are of earthly concern, it's very difficult for you to really begin to cooperate with what's going on in heaven. People want to talk to me about religion. They want to talk to me about legalism. They want to talk to me about this and that and the other thing. My issue to you right now, my petition to you right now is do you know what God is doing and are you doing it with them? Because no man has anything unless he first receives it from heaven and nobody can do anything unless he sees the Father do it. When it comes to a lasting change and impact upon humanity, this is the, this is the, these are the decisions we're going to have to make. Is the lust that big of a deal to you? Huh? Is the cares of life that big of a deal to you? This is why we pray and ask that God give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. That your eyes may be open so you can really see what's going on. So that you're no longer impacted by all of these things that are going on in the world. And all it is, is all that is going on in the world. All that we call fashion. All that we call style. All that we call interest. All that we call uh, in, in a world uh, uh, that we live in uh, entertainment and that which we value is actually designed in propagation, designed propagation and slander of Satan against the, against the Father. Angels create a realm, spiritual wickedness in high places, design a realm of iniquity and deception, and that becomes superimposed upon men as they participate with an unholy desire. When you recognize 
that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not in your heart. It's something that belongs to a world outside you. It's something that demon spirits are trying to impose upon you. They are trying by their deceptive power to make it your desire. <laughs> All of a sudden you have a means to stand up against that power of darkness and to recognize that demon spirit and take of authority over it for what it is. It cannot lo no longer work its work of deception upon you. When you believe what God says about you, when you believe that He's given you His nature, when you believe that He's written His laws and His ways upon the tables of your heart, when you believe that God lives in you, that your spirit is joined unto the Lord, when all those affections and all those things that belong to the nature of Christ Jesus has been placed on the inside of you and that's what you really want, that's what the new creation desires, then when these things come that are made by demon spirits to look like something you cannot live without, something that you are craving, Suddenly you're able to deal with a deceptive power. And in the name of Jesus Christ, execute authority over that which would destroy you now and eternity in a place called hell. People are afflicted with all kinds of torment and fear, sicknesses and disease because they, give, they open the door to iniquity. Satan will access your life through sexual immorality and pornography, through fornication, more than anything else. I'm telling you, and that's why it saturates the culture and the society that we live in. It's his weapon that he's formed against you. And it's prospering. You can say all you want, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. You have to get yourself over the anointing for that to be true. Huh? Because I see people being taken out by the slightest little demon influence because they don't even understand. They're continually listening to the voices of slander and accusation that Satan propagates throughout the land saying, oh, the things that God has, they're disinteresting. Somebody tried to tell me the other day, well, I sit down and I drink alcohol because that's the way I'm able to go and minister Jesus to these people. <laughs> My goodness gracious, do you actually believe that? Huh? And then going to go on and try to tell me how the Jesus turned water, water into wine. It was alcoholic wine. I said, okay, well, let's just consider this for just a minute. Okay? Let's go with this. Let's go with this and, and with your interpretation of the scripture. And, and the governor said that after men were well drunk. You ever seen somebody well drunk? Huh? After men were well drunk, intoxicated, now Jesus is going to make 120 bottles of better wine, more intoxicating wine, so people can get absolutely Huh? Smashed. That is nuts. That is nuts. Everybody agrees that it's a sin to become intoxicated. The issue of to drink wine or not to drink wine is not the, case. Not the issue. It's to become intoxicated because intoxication is a work of iniquity. It's a work of demon spirits. John said, let no man deceive you. He that sins is of the devil. That's what he said. That's what he said. He was set on us understanding that there's seducing spirits and powers of darkness that would try to make us believe that we're right when we're wrong. 1 John 3, 7 and 8, you read it. And I can go on and on and on with list of verses of Scripture as I'm giving you tonight, like in Ephesians 5, 6, as I gave you already, huh? as 1 John 5, 18. And now I'm giving you 1 John 3, 7 and 8. I got the word of God in me. <laughs> I'm strong. I have the word of God in me. And I've overcome the wicked one. Where did I get my strength? I have the strength of the Lord and the power of his might was given to me by the Holy Ghost. I choose God. And when I choose God, all heavens mobilize to accept me. Amen. And to protect me and to preserve me and, and you as well. Amen. You walk around saying, oh, there's none righteous. No, not one. That's not the faith. Paul is describing the state of the Jewish rebellious heart that had been an incurable wound since the days of Isaiah and prophesied by the psalmist. True. True. He's making an argument that men need Christ Jesus to be right with God. And men want to twist the scripture by satanic, demonic influence and put that identity on you and me. And it's a power of deception that will overthrow you and keep you from ever being an overcomer. For as long as you believe that you're unrighteous, as long as you believe you're a sinner, as long as you are helpless before demon influence, you'll never overcome them. It's only by this faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world. This is John 
This is the conquering power that overcomes the world, even our faith. What is our faith? This is the faith, Christ in me. Hallelujah. To be strong in the strength of the Lord and the power of His might. To tread upon scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy. To be able to go everywhere in the name of Jesus Christ. And have absolute authority to cast out devils. You're going to cast out a devil that just played games in your spirit? Just came and violated you in an intimate way? For the only thing that can make you unclean, that the only thing that can make you impure is that which we enter into your heart. And I can't think of a more intimate interaction with something than allowing it to come into my heart. A demon spirit comes with its sin and it is iniquity and you cave into it because you're blind and cannot see afar off and have forgotten that you were purged from your old sin, forgotten that you were made a new creation. For those of you who don't realize, I just quoted uh, the scripture in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, which preceded the verse of scripture that I read to you already. Huh? Hallelujah. Now, praise God, I, there's some guys who are cre who've created... There's some guys who created. Look, you're going to have to quit letting that unclean spirit have its way in your life. There's some guys who created a, an application that they're just. And I, 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 I pray that it gets, it gets out so people can understand there's an application. You can go and, and see what verses of Scripture I'm quoting right now. And I'm praying in Jesus' name and make it available to everybody so you can just get the Word of God in you. Is it God's Word or not? If it's God's Word, it's true. If it's God's truth, if it's God's Word, it's the authority that will overcome the wicked one. It's the, the, the lie cannot overcome the truth. Truth overcomes the lie. Jesus said <laughs> that the truth should set, set you free. <laughs> the truth overcomes the lie. You need the Word of God in you. You want to overcome the wicked one? You need the Word of God in you. Amen. 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 What are you going to believe about yourself? So many people have been so influenced by all these ideas. The opinions of men. Their own experience. The things that their friends and teachers have said about them. Things that their ministers and leaders have said concerning their experience in God. That doesn't line up with what God has said. And then they take those things and they try to blend them with the Word of God and they make the Word of God ineffective so that you don't see the power of salvation, you don't see the working, the demonstration of those things which God described in His Word. You know, we can see it work to a degree when uh, the disciples who had received authority and assignment from the Lord Jesus Christ to go raise the dead, cast out devils, cure the sick and the diseased. They come to a young boy who Satan would often come upon him. And when Satan would seize the young boy, he would throw him in the fire to try to destroy him or throw him in the water to try to destroy him. That's what Satan does. He just does it in different ways. He does it through various different um, actions and activities. And, and, and uh, for most people, it's not that intense. But nonetheless... That's the, that's, the, that's the demonic world for you, right there. And the disciples wasn't, weren't able to cast out the devil. Somehow the word of God and the authority of God had been neutralized and had become ineffective. And if we look closer at that verse of Scripture, we'll see that what was going on was the disciples were interacting with the scribes and the Pharisees. They were getting, they were getting the opinion of the people who were blind did not understand and was guessing based upon their own perception and their own opinion and their own diagnosis of things. <laughs> Back in those days, they believed as soon as it got to be a full moon, anybody who had any uh, susceptibility to demon spirits would start acting up because the demon spirits came out in the full moon and therefore he was lunar struck. And there's nothing you really could do about it. You're going to have to wait till the full moon goes away. What a diagnosis. <laughs> and, the, and the disciples are going, oh, really? Oh, really? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so that's what's going on. And what happens now, Jesus comes and said, what are you doing talking to those guys? What are you doing communing with them? What, what are you listening to their opinion? Their doctrines, their ideas, their perceptions, their understanding. Listen, none of your perceptions are accurate. 
You should have already gotten beat up enough in school to recognize that. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Are you listening to me? You gotta take another IQ test. <laughs> Their perceptions just aren't really that accurate. Come on now. Come on now. Hey, you know, you would have done a whole lot more with your life if your perceptions were a little bit more accurate. <laughs> perceptions aren't that accurate, your people. Your ideas, your conclusions, the things that you're distilling out of the situation <laughs> and experiences. They're not accurate. You're going to have to turn to the Word of God. You're going to have to put your trust in the Lord. You're going to have to understand He's going to deliver you out of whatever situation you find yourself in. Father's going to raise you up. He's going to make you strong. He's giving you the ability. He's giving you the authority. Then everything be more than a conqueror. You have to run to Him. The righteous run into the to the name of the Lord. The righteous run to the name of Jesus. So many people get in, overcome by circumstances, get overcome by situations, be overcome by failure and discouragement. They don't run to the Lord Jesus with it. They run to earthly things. And all that's going to do is imprison you more. But if you just run to Him, if you just run to Him, if you just cleave to Him, if you just put your trust in Him, I'm telling you, He'll open up a door of success for you. He'll, make a, he'll provide for you a way to enter into this realm that we're talking about where you can find yourself living in all the good things that He's provided for us in Christ Jesus. Of course, the disciples said, well, why couldn't we cast them out? Jesus said, because of unbelief. You, you know, I didn't point that out, but the first thing that the Lord says in, in, in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, that are not part of the inheritance, that are outside of the kingdom, outside of the realm of His glory, outside of the realm of fellowship with Him, are the, those who are a doubt, full of doubt and unbelief. Doubt will constantly keep you staggering between two opinions. James says, a double-minded man is a person who's a doubter. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. He will never get anything from God. You're going to have to find a place of stability. And the only place you're going to find a place of stability is when Christ Jesus becomes the anchor of your soul. When going to Him, where you begin to find a place of living in His presence in the holies of holies, and you, you're, you're steadfast there, you're not going out anymore. Hallelujah. God wants to make you a pillar in His house. Isn't that beautiful? They that overcome, I will make a pillar in my house. They that overcome, I will, give the, I will write out a new name for them and I'll give them a new name. Those that overcome will sit down with me in my throne even as I sit down with my Father in His throne. They that overcome shall be dressed in white raiment for they are worthy. I'm interested. Are you interested? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a good lineup there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Praise God. To understand you don't belong to Satan anymore. You belong to God. To understand you're not a part of darkness anymore. You're part of light. You don't live in the realm of darkness anymore. You live in the realm of light. You don't really live in the realm of Satan anymore. You live in the realm of God. You don't live in the realm of lies anymore. You live in the realm of truth. I want to learn the truth. Where is truth? Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the light. No man can come to the Father except by me. He said, my word which I've spoken unto you, it's truth. My word sanctifies you and sets you apart. To live by the word. Understand, God took Israel through the desert, Deuteronomy chapter 8, through some very hard and difficult times so that they could learn that man's existence wasn't just about an earthly existence of which you need bread and food for. He said he took them through a, a, a difficult situation where they would have to learn to trust him and rely upon him so that they could understand that man lives by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now remember what Peter said. Peter said there in 2 Peter chapter 1, a little bit later on in the same chapter, he said we were there. In the Mount of Transfiguration. We saw the glory of God. We heard the voice of God. When he spoke. 
to his only begotten son and said, this is my son, whom I'm well pleased, hear ye him. He said, but you have a more certain word of prophecy that you do well if you take heed unto as a light that shines in a dark place. His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. There's only one way to know what is really taking place in your life. There's only one way to really know what's taking place around you. There's only one way to be certain that you're not being deceived. And that is to give place and give heed to the word of God. For it's breathed out by him. It's those words which proceed out of the mouth of God. Scripture tells us that after Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. And baptized not only in the Jordan in water. But immediately baptized in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Spirit of the Lord came upon him and remained. That's what it means to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, amen. amen. We got the same anointing he got. It's not an anointing. Comes on, lifts off, comes on, lifts off. Comes upon and remains. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And immediately the scripture says in Mark that the Spirit of the Lord drove him into the wilderness. Get yourself out into the wilderness right now. Get yourself separated right now. Get yourself away from everything that is in the world. Get yourself away from all the influence and all the ideas and concepts of men. Get away from it. And for 40 days, he was tempted of Satan in the wilderness. Not just one day, for 40 days. And if you want evidence of that, I, it's, in, it's in my book, Sequential Events of the Gospels. I'll give you evidence. It's not just my evidence. I, you know, I quote... Many different expert sources. People who studied the Word of God, gave the light to study the Word of God. You know, 200 years ago, men, when men were scholars in the Word of God, that's all they did. 8, 10, 12 hours a day studied the Word of God. And uh, my goodness, what, what do we, what, we, I pray, Father, raise up such people today. But at any rate, Jesus was tempted 40 days in the wilderness. One of the temptations, and of course we know that after 40 days... <clears throat> The temptations also came just that much more surmounting upon him. And Satan, what does he do? He questions his identity. If you're really the son of God. What do you mean if you're really the son? You're stupid, Satan. I mean, my, I'm a bystander saying, you're stupid, man. What do you say if you're really the son of God? But that's not what he does. He does it to you and me. Oh, if you were really saved, if you're really, the, if you're really a child of God, if you're really a child of light. Questioning our identity, trying to draw us into his illusion, trying to draw us into his concepts of who we are, trying to draw us into his slander. <laughs> mm. That's why we need watchmen over our soul. My wife said, my goodness, wouldn't it have been great if Adam would have been a true leader and walked over and slapped that apple or whatever it was out of Eve's hand. <laughs> said, what are you doing, woman? Huh? If he had been a man stepped up to his place, things had turned out different. <laughs> we need leaders in our lives. Say, hey, what you doing? Somebody said, you can't tell me what to do. Well, I'm a, you know, I'll tell you right now, that may be true, but I'm going to scream and holler and try to prevent you from going to hell with everything I can. Uh, I'm going to do all the slapping I can. Scripture says, let the righteous smite me. It would be a health to me. Huh? Somebody said, if you, if you do it differently, you'd have a bigger church. I'm not interested in a... And, and, and numbers. I'm interested in the bigness of the presence of God because you got a bunch of people who are willing to walk with God in spirit and truth, willing to do that which is right in the sight of the Lord, willing to be salt, willing to be the light of the world, willing to be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the members of his very body placed into a, a group and an assembly by the Holy Ghost as he wills and as he determines is right, the rightful use of our lives. Oh, oh, that the church of Jesus Christ should rise again. Yes. Oh, the purity of Christ Jesus and the beauty and the, pre the presence of the Lord should captivate the hearts of men. They would want to live for Jesus and live in a heavenly realm rather than live in their own interest and be continually taken by every whim and will of Satan. Satan says, if you be the son of God, if you, want, if you are who you say you are, Turn these stones into bread. There's all these influence constantly coming. There's all these ideas and all these suggestions. 
And until you begin to walk with God and bathe yourself in the Word of God and give yourself to a place of coming under a continual influence of the Holy Ghost, you have no ability to discern these slanderous, accusing words of Satan that has come to deceive you and carry you away and influence you and neutralize you and keep you from living by the Word of God. Jesus simply just says to him, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's how you live. You want to understand how to live? You want to understand how the spiritual life works? The spiritual life lives. The spiritual life grows. The spiritual life matures because the spiritual life is fed by the Word of God and only lives and only exists by the Word of God. God wants you and I to walk in the Spirit. If we're going to walk in the Spirit, we're going to live by the Word of God. If the Word of God is going to be everything that we believe. It's going to define for us reality. That's it. <laughs> That's it really becomes a hard situation when you read a scripture like, let not the inhabitants of the Lord say I'm sick, and all of a sudden, you're feeling really sick. <laughs> and, and your throat's sore, and your nose is all clogged up, and you achy all over. Uh, let not the inhabitants of the Lord say I'm sick. Now we're in some trouble. Huh? Because the Lord is, is, is promised to heal all of our diseases, just as sure as he's cleansed our iniquity. Huh? Okay, I pray. Now where's the medicine cabinet? Where's the night quail? Well, I tell you, if you begin to stand in the word of God and count God faithful, and you begin to press in and know that there is a provision for your health, you'll discover a realm of living in divine health. We just had the Makoto family come from Japan, pastors there, pastored for 30 years in Japan. He came to Japan. He was in a meeting uh, that we were in in Tokyo. He came up. He was sick. And I said, from now on, you live in divine health. power of God touched him. He got healed. And he's so interested in understanding how to stay healed, live in divine health, he decided to take his vacation, come here and meet with me, and I left. <laughs> because I had something else I needed to do. But I spent some time with him. He got to spend some time with Geneva. Huh? He just, I said, it's not me that you're seeking. It's Jesus. I got to go. He'll stay with you. <laughs> it's not me that you want. It's the Holy Ghost. All I did was deliver to you what God says in his word. And you got touched by the power of it. And you're, you're all interested in knowing how to continue in it. Let me tell you, that's nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's everything to do with your walk with God. <laughs> Praise the name of Jesus. Our Father wants to teach you that there is only one truth. And all these ideas and all these concepts aren't true. If you take a hold of his word and begin to live by his word, you won't veer to the right or to the left. You learn how to walk with him in obedience to his word, believe in those things which he said about you. You go look in the mirror, what do you see? I look in the mirror, I see the glory of the Lord. I see a place, a tabernacle where the Holy Ghost dwells. Huh? I don't see some ugly mug. Huh? 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 Hallelujah. Huh? Huh? I, I see what God has created. I see Allah Bakara, see to laminate. I take care of his body. You know, we clean it up, praise God. And then, uh, it's his temple, though. It's his. It belongs to him. He said, it's his. He said, told me, he said, it's not yours. He said, you, uh, you're my purchased possession. I bought you. I redeemed you. You're not your own. You belong to me. Therefore, glorify me in your body and your spirit. I believe that. I recognize I have no right to do with my hands what I want to do with them. They are the servants of the Lord. Romans chapter 6 declares to us clearly that our, our, our hands, our, our members now are weapons of righteousness. Hallelujah. Once they were instruments of sin and iniquity. Now the instruments or weapons literally is the word. Weapons of righteousness. Right now our life is to be uh, slaves and servants of righteousness and have our fruit unto holiness and the end thereof everlasting life. Ha! Hallelujah. Right, that's what God said. That's what God said. That's what God said in Romans chapter 6 and verse 22. Amen. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's what God said. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 
Hallelujah. He became the sin offering for me that I might be, become, that I might be the righteousness of God to him. Hallelujah. Living in Jesus. Somebody said, well, that's not reality. That's not the way it goes down around yeah, here. That's not, that's not the human experience. Human experience is an illusion. It's a deception. It's a realm impacted and afflicted and overwhelmed by the conversation of Satan. I'm praying for everybody sick and diseased in their body tonight. And I believe in God you're going to be healed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close or change the order of the service with this verse of Scripture in Luke chapter 13. I'm going to make a shift here. Okay? It's, it's, it's a shift, but it's really along the same topic, along the same lines. And I don't know where my Bible is. I've left it somewhere. It's a good thing I have it in my heart. I was prepared if I was ever put in prison. I can write out the Scriptures. I gave myself to memorizing the Word of God. Somebody said, I don't have a good brain. Somebody lied to you, and you believed it. Huh? I'll tell you right now, you begin to read the Word of God, and the, script, the Scripture says the Holy Ghost will bring it to your remembrance. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> How many of you have a 15-minute commute or more to work? 15-minute 15 15 commute or more to work. Write out a verse of Scripture on a piece of paper. Memorize it on the way to work. The Lord will protect you. <laughs> You'll glance at it less than a text. Huh? Are you listening to me? Yeah. Next day, write out another verse of Scripture with it. Before long, you'll have whole chapters. And then you'll have whole books of the Bible laid up in your heart. Amen. Deceiver comes along to deceive. Liars come along to lie. The Word of God's there protecting you. It's a shield. It's a shield of truth. Huh? I got a breastplate of righteousness. I have a shield of faith. It's called also a shield of truth. People start saying things, verses of Scripture start popping in my mind. Father, keeps my heart with all diligence. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm not interested in what the devil is saying. Somebody said, I'm going to send you an email and tell you what I think. I'm not going to read that email. <laughs> <laughs> I get discernment over emails. They're like, is this a complaining email? 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 I had this one titled, I'm a prophetess. I just deleted that one. <laughs> if that's the introduction, I don't want to have a, I'm not interested. I'm not interested in delete. I'm not interested in what Satan's got to say. It's lie and accusation try to discourage us. Huh? Try to berate us. Huh? Try to God, accuse us. God. He's not doing that. God, the Holy Ghost, come comfort us. Praise God. Jesus is interceding on our behalf. He's telling us, get the job done. He's saying, get it done. <laughs> he, said, he said, I'm giving you the ability to go everywhere and preach the gospel. All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go! All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go! Go! Go in my stead. Go on my behalf. Go in my anointing. Go on my power. Go on my ministry. Go and do these works and greater works. Amen. 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 We're getting ready to invade China with literature. I called up a friend of mine this morning. I said, look, I said, there's a bad situation in, Ch uh, forgive me, Japan. I said, there's a bad situation in Japan. They have very little uh, 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 literature about flowing, operating in the Holy Ghost. So we've got to start putting things in the Japanese. He said, I already have some books in Japanese. I said, we'll send them. Let's get them over there. He said, I'm sending them right away. If you're watching right now, get them in the mail. Whatever. UPS, FedEx. We're going to start doing one of the things that really captivate the hearts of the Japanese people are cartoon characters. And we got a bunch of folks who are good in art. We're going to get them fixed on doing uh, cartoon characters. After the fashion of that which the Japanese like. But we gospel messages and we're going to get the thing sat we're going to, we're going to saturate the place. Hallelujah. We can go over there and we're going to start with a crowd, outdoor crowd of about 500 to 1,000 people. And then over time, over the, over the next couple of years, we're going to build it to 60,000. Yeah. Amen. 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 We're, the Lord has just told me to focus on, focus on this city this year. And so we're going to run after the city uh, like 
never before. We're going to go running after the lost. We're going to see a thousand people come into the kingdom it, just here in this, within this next 12 months. Watch what happens. Watch what happens. We, the Lord's just asking for a tithe of your time. Uh, two and a half hours of your time every day. A tithe of your time. And He's going to take it and He's going to bless it in such a way that you'll be able to look back on 2014 and say that was 12 months. That was a time of my life that I gave everything to the kingdom to do the work of the ministry, to follow Jesus and reach the lost. That's what's going to happen for you in 2014. Yes. It's going to set you up for the rest of your life. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise. I was just so blessed. Amen. Yeah, amen. Give a shout. Give a clap. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was so blessed by Joseph's sharing last Sunday. I felt such an anointing power of God upon it, talking about the things that God was doing at the retirement homes. It's a bus stop to eternity, you know, going there and start talking to people about their need to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus before it's eternally too late. Give them one last chance, one last opportunity. Oh, my God, I pray that the same compassion and same love of God that so filled his heart that he gave his only begotten son, you'll allow these same things to fill your heart. These are important evidence that you belong to the kingdom and that you've been made a new creation. I pray that that same joy and that same love that took Jesus to the cross, and I'm telling you, he hugged that cross. Somebody said, oh, somebody should have carried that cross for him. He hugged that cross. He hugged that cross for you and me. He hugged it. He counted it joy, despised it the shame. He hugged it all the way till Golgotha, all the way to the, to the place of the skull, the mount of crucifixion. That same love come upon our lives as we baptize in the Holy Ghost and fire. And it won't be an obligation. It won't be some kind of legal duty. It'll be, it'll be the desire of your heart. It'll be, it'll be the passion that fills your soul as we were singing tonight. It's the fire of God in my bones. It's the fire of God in my heart and in my life. I love that song, man. Since Ruth Anna started singing a powerful anointing. Powerful anointing. I believe God has purpose to increase the anointing, which is the expression of His manifest presence in your life and through your life this year, if you're willing. 2014 is the year of great fruitfulness. It's a year of great harvest. It's a year of great opportunity in God. I pray in the name of Jesus you'll seize it. I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I know right now it's very clear to me this month, right now, God has given us a divine opportunity. I don't, I, don't you worry about Fukushima. I prayed over it and God's going to work a miracle and heal the reactor in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. And besides that, we don't flame can't kindle upon us. We don't drown. We don't burn. And pestilence that wax at noonday don't affect us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> hey, man, you can eat radioactive, radioactive, radioactivity for breakfast. 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 And it won't hurt. Cesium, iodine. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Hallelujah. Praise God. It'll be health to your bones, strength to your navel. Oh, Amen. You just get stronger in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because that's what God says. I shall not fear the arrow that flies by night, nor the pestilence that waxes, wasteth at noonday. <laughs> so fall, a, t a thousand shall fall on my side and ten thousand at my right hand, but it shall not come nigh me. Why? Because I live in another reality. Uh, I live in a place where God upholds me. Angels surround and encamp about me. Holy Ghost has baptized me in His presence and power. God, He keeps me. Hallelujah. He upholds me. He preserves me until that day. Hallelujah. I'm only going away if He chooses. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They, they couldn't kill John no matter how they tried because God chose to keep him alive. Huh? James went ahead is an offering and sacrifice. They killed him. He just jump-started the program. Huh? Come right in after Stephen, my goodness, and jump-started the program. Praise God. Blessed is the name of the Lord. I mean, forgive me. It's the other way around. He jump-started the program, and uh, then Stephen came right in behind him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to give you the interpretation in a minute. Just hang on. 
Hallelujah. I'm not building myself up right now. I'm prophesying. Hallelujah. I'm going to excel, you know. Tongues are supposed to excel. They're supposed to excel into interpretation, excel into prophecy, excel into miracles, signs and wonders, gifts of healing, excel. Hallelujah. It's the entrance gift. It's the first thing that happened in the event of Pentecost. And it's that which we're supposed to continue in against popular opinion. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to do what Paul did in Jesus' name. He spoke in tongues more than them all. Amen. Amen. But if, if it came to ministering to the lost and the unbeliever, he'd rather speak uh, ten words with the understanding than ten thousand with another language. Huh? So... We're giving you plenty of both, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And besides that, as long as it's interpreted and it's done decently and in order, and that means it's under the influence of the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, and it's not all a confusing thing, then it's a good thing in the church. It needs to be in the church, and we want you to have that. We want you to step into the gift of interpretation of tongues on Sunday morning and Sunday night and on Wednesday night, and then get all, go ahead and get on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, <laughs> and Saturday too. We want to send you out to the different places just like they did in the days of old. And you go around here and you knock on doors and you say to people, listen, we hear, we're the servants of the Lord. We're here to pray for you. Do you have any needs? Do you have anything you want us to pray for? Is there anybody sick in your house? Do you have any disease here? Do you have anything, any problems, any issues that you would call, want us to call on God on your behalf? And I'm telling you, watch what takes place. You're going, to have to, you're going to have to know, though. You're going to have to have a boldness and a certainty and a confidence. And that powers of darkness are set against your boldness. There's all these threat, threatenings, all these lies of Satan trying to steal from you your confidence and your boldness. I'm going to have Pastor Daniel lead the prayer on uh, Friday nights and um, before School of the Spirit. And what we're going to do is um, we're going to teach people to pray the scripture. And I'm going, to have, I'm going to have Angelo and a couple of other people begin to work with younger people, help them be able to understand how to boldly and confidently share what Jesus did in their life. Because I see people stumbling around all the time. Get a hold, get a hold of the power of God and the anointing of God, begin to speak the word of God. I mean, you'll be, find yourself speaking by the Spirit in no time. Instead of praying your own prayers, pray the prayers that God prayed. I love praying the prayer that they prayed in Acts chapter 4. Behold their threatenings, O God. And, 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 and grant your servants boldness uh, by giving signs and wonders, by stretching forth your hand and providing signs and wonders by your holy child, Jesus. It's beautiful how they prayed that. Jesus is, hallelujah, on the throne of glory. And he's still referring to Jesus as the holy child, Jesus where God manifested in the flesh. He became everything that we are, that we might become one with Him. Hallelujah. Became everything that we are, that we might have everything that He has freely. He gifts it to us. He'll always be in the position of God. We'll always bow before Him. But it's an amazing thing how He's caused us to inherit everything that He has. It's an unspeakable gift. But Paul said it that way, and it's right. It's an unspeakable gift, what He's done for us. I tell you, it's worth all of our time. It's worth all of our money. It's worth all, all of our interest, all that God has prepared for us. We'll look back upon the short time of this life. Throughout eternity, we'll be able to live on the things that we were allowed to do in God's grace and in His mercy in our sojourn here. The opportunity where now we stand against all the powers of darkness and all the forces of this world. And even though it may seem we stand alone, we have the opportunity to stand the biggest and the most effective who will ever stand on behalf of the Lord for all of the ages to come. Of course, I don't know a lot about all the ages to come. There's so many things that hasn't been revealed. We'll rule and reign with Him for a thousand years, and then it gets even glorious, more glorious after that. It gets so glorious over that after that, He didn't even describe it. You know that? He just told us what we're going to do for a thousand years. We'll reign with him. We'll reign with him in a thousand years. And after that, he'll create a new heaven and a new earth. And gather us all together unto him, in him. 
in a place called the New Jerusalem. Hallelujah. The heavenly city of God that comes down out of heaven, heals all the earth forever and forever. And there'll never be sin anymore. Hallelujah. Never be sin will be purged. The event to Satan is never going to be a possibility again. Radical. Can't even imagine what all we're going to do right now. We're just going to talk about what we're supposed to do now. And in a sense, we're talking about what we're speculating what we're going to do then when we've got so much to do right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Ha. Ha. Hallelujah. 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 We're going to see the king. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> we'll be gathered around this throne, for we are going to see the king. We'll be gathered around this, this throne, for we're going to see the king. Father, in your mercy and your grace, I ask you, Lord, cause us to just be lifted up into a realm of wisdom and understanding that we may be able to see you, that we may be occupied with heavenly things, that we may see you before us and on our right hand that we should not be moved. Oh God, that heaven would become a reality to us. Oh God, that your person would become more real to us than anything of earthly interest so that we may begin to do those things that you've commissioned us to do in an effective way. Father, we cry out for your mercy now. Oh, God, you see, Lord, how Satan has been able to lie. You see how Satan has been able to deceive us. You see, oh, God, how we've been tripped up over and over again. Father, we want to learn how to live for you. We want to learn how to walk with you in such a way that we shall never stumble ever again. Oh, God, to walk in that authority, to walk in that grace, to always do those things which please you, Father. Father, in Jesus' name, to have all of our affections and all of our desires in you, God. In Jesus' name. In the name of the most high God, Satan, you listen to me. You take your filthy hands off the property of God. You take your filthy hands off this city and off this region. You mind-blinding power of darkness. I render you powerless in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Set these people free. To walk in the light of His yes. majesty and the light of His glory. To no longer come under the influences of discouragement. To no longer come under the influence of accusation. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let me just, I want to close with this verse of Scripture here in Luke chapter 13. And, and I just want to start in verse 10. And Jesus was teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity. 18 years. I want you to look at how Satan works he is the author of sickness and disease. He is the one who places sicknesses and diseases in our body in many different ways, in many different forms. And we're just going to have to stop trying to normalize it and make it a virus and make it a bacteria because you don't even know what that is anyways. Are you listening to me? Yes. And especially when it comes to virology, that is a sticky subject. And bacteria is just as weird. What we have to understand is Satan goes about tormenting and afflicting people. And Christ Jesus has come with the gospel, the good news, and given us life-giving power and authority to bring healing and deliverance to everyone that we encounter spiritually, physically, mentally, materially, in every way. Here Jesus comes in the synagogue and there is a woman who's been afflicted by Satan with a spirit, who has a spirit, spirit of infirmity. And it had been a spirit of infirmity, it's a demon spirit, had been on her for 18 years. Let me just say this. This is how I deal with sickness and disease. Look, I was trained in microbiology. I went through uh, 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 those various different courses 
in virology. I spend a lot of time in immunochemistry. I spend a lot of time in molecular biology. I understand all of the influences of science and the perceptions of men. I'm telling you that is not reality. Just because we understand a few cause and effects, just because we understand certain things and, and, and certain ideas and principles about how it works don't mean that that is truth or reality. This is how I deal with sickness and disease. I deal with it as a demon spirit. And dealing with it as a demon spirit, I am very effective against it. When something tries to get my body, I say, you foul spirit of hell, you leave me alone, you get off of me now in Jesus' name. I don't say, oh, I got a cold, it's going around. <laughs> I'm going to go get my flu shot. I don't do that because it's spiritual realm to me. Reality, it, reality isn't defined by all these earthly things. And it shouldn't be, especially when you know that Satan is the prince of the power of the air, the god of this world, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience, that he's the arch deceiver, that he lies in wait to deceive you. Huh? And that all these things that he's doing, he's running an interference against what God has purposed to do in your life. And you make the decision as to how much Satan is going to be allowed to have his way with you. Right. Everyone I know who's flowed and operated in the gifts of the Spirit, who've had authority over sickness and disease and have grown and matured in that authority over sickness and disease has always dealt with sickness and disease as an evil spirit. Jesus deals with it as an evil spirit. He says here, this woman has a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could not lift herself up. And when Jesus saw her, he called unto her and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from your infirmity. And this is the ministry of Jesus. It's literally heaven invading the realms of men's life and demanding that Satan evacuate. <laughs> it's the good news where now men come under the glory and the goodness and the blessings of God and Satan has to take his torment and his affliction and depart. Amen. 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 And he laid his hands on her. The ministry of the laying on of hands. Some people don't believe in the ministry of laying on of hands. I can't even imagine why. I don't even understand it. Let me lay hands on you right now. <laughs> Jesus laid his hands on her. And immediately she was straight. Immediately she straightened up. She made straight and glorified God. And the rulers of the synagogue answered in indignation. Look at that. That's the way it works. If you're going to start flowing and operating the ministry of Jesus, I'm telling you right now, you're going to come under attack by religion. You're going to come under attack by religion. And so Jesus simply said to them, Should it this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, she's a part of the covenant children, and of course, healing was the children's bread. That's what Jesus said. How many of you realize that healing, Jesus said healing is the children's bread. That's what you have for daily food. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen? Jesus said to the woman, the Syrophoenician woman, who brought her daughter to Jesus so that Jesus might heal her for she was demon possessed grievously afflicted and tormented by the devil Jesus said it's not right for me to take and give the children's bread which is healing and deliverance to the dogs and of course the woman's prayer and her petition for the Lord Jesus Christ prevailed with him it's the closest time that, Je that Jesus ever said no to someone I'm not going to heal you and then they wouldn't leave it there. And so he went ahead and healed them. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. To say that it's not God's will for you to be healed is the same as say it's not God's will for you to be delivered from sin and sickness. Or from sin and, 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 and tormenting evil spirits. I know that these things are hard for many to understand. Because you're so influenced by the philosophy of men you're so influenced 
by so-called science and, and men's perception and understanding. You believe you have another explanation. I say you didn't have an explanation at all. Huh? I, really, I say you didn't have an explanation at all. I tell you right now, God alone has the cure. God, only, God alone has the lasting cure. And when he sends out his servants to go and do his work on his behalf, the first thing he does is give them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out. Jesus said, should not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan hath bound these 18 years, should she not be loosed? When I see people being tormented and afflicted, first thing I feel and I'm overwhelmed with is the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. They can't remain in that state. We went to the fair this past year. First time we went to the fair, I don't know, maybe 20 years or something like that. Did a family day at the fair. And I was just, I was just captivated by all the people that needed to be healed. I saw a child in a wheelchair and my heart was overwhelmed with compassion for the child. The child was severely mentally affected. Couldn't keep his focus. I wanted to go over there and hug that child. But recognized that there was no opportunity for me to be able to do such things. I walk around, I see people walk by me, I know he's got drugs on him. I know there's one person walk by me, spirit of violence. I see people walking by, seeing all these things going on, demon activity in the line. But for me, those are the most important words of knowledge. Huh? To know what's going on, what Satan's trying to do to destroy them, to understand the call of God for their life, and speak the word of life and deliverance to them. And I'm purposed that here this year in 2014 that there would be an atmosphere of faith. See, if we begin to praise God in the san His sanctuary, in the atmosphere of His power, suddenly things around us will begin to change. If, if you're not going to allow Satan to neutralize you anymore, you're not going to allow Satan to invalidate your authority to try to steal away from you your inheritance, where you can begin to come boldly and confidently by the blood of Jesus Christ into the th throne room of God and stand here in the holies of holies and with a clear conscience, with a clean heart, with pure hands, hallelujah, uh, with pure heart and clean hands, either way. Be, just stand here in the presence of God and boldly receive those things which Father has provided for us and begin to be the light shining in a dark place, a salt to, to, uh, to the earth. To begin to be the provision of God's grace manifested here in this city and in this region. I'm telling you, an atmosphere of faith will begin to rise and begin to grow here in San Diego, California. And we'll be able to have opportunity to be in places like the fairground, be walking around and speaking the word of life and seeing, I mean, people uh, by the thousands come to Jesus. The one wonderful thing about a fairground is some people are there looking for something. Uh, their expectation is high. They're looking for something to fulfill a desire. They're looking for, they're, uh, they're looking for something to help them. They're looking for some kind of excitement. They're looking for something they don't really really know what it is. They're just looking around. Where is it? And you can feel that. And you walk in to such, an, such a place with the power and the authority of God. And be able to get a platform in that atmosphere of faith and divine authority. Begin to preach the gospel at the fairgrounds in 2014 this year. Huh? And watch the power of God strike people. Watch people begin to get up out of wheelchairs. Children who have neurotube defect and are paralyzed and from the waist down, from the neck down, all kinds of terrible things that have afflicted their soul and afflicted their life. The powers of Satan have worked to destroy their body and soul.
Come on, man. I believe in God that this next week we can begin to find people that we can assign to be a part of a Christmas program that the Lord's laid on my heart to do in 2014 in different places of the county. And I've set it up where, when, where we're going to have in the Christmas play every, every prophetic utterance in the Old Testament concerning the coming of Christ Jesus and His birth and every prophetic utterance in the New Testament concerning the birth of the Lord Je- the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in his birth and I, with and to be able to grab a hold of it with such authority and such anointing that it sounds like we the first per- person ever prophesying have the same voice by which God prophesied through those whom he spoke that word originally through and it would have the same impact and have the same effect. Wouldn't it be amazing to take hold of the power of God, not have to have fake angels, that the angels actually show up? Hallelujah. <laughs> 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 huh? Well, wouldn't that be great? Don't need any angels. I mean, we're going have, to have to have a Gabriel angel, you know, because of the prophecies and the declarations that Gabriel gave. Huh? You're going to have to have a Mary because she's central, central uh, figure to, to that which uh, God spoke in, in prophetic utterance concerning who his son was, who his son was going to be. Got to have a Joseph uh, because of the prophecy that came, before, came forth from his lips as God revealed to him in a dream, his name shall be called Jesus for he shall save his people from his sins. Can you feel it? Yes. Can you feel it? Are you going to get, I pray you get signed up for this and you start rehearsing this. I want to I, I begin like next week and we'll be ready for sure by December. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Amen. Take you to prayer. Praise God. Pray over it every day. Ask God for the anointing. Begin to get a strategy of where it's going to, you know, where we're going to go and do it. I mean, I'm, I'm right now my heart's set. If there's a possibility in any of the days over the three weeks during that period of time of Christmas to at least be able to do it once in Balboa Park in the theater there. I've got several other theaters on my heart. I'm ready to get it started right now. Come on, people. I believe 2014 is a time for the power of God to begin to be unveiled to this city and to begin to be unveiled to this region. The Lord doesn't care. The Lord's not picky about how he who he uses. He's just looking for anybody who's willing. Scripture says his eyes go to and fro looking for someone who he can show himself mighty on their behalf. Someone who's willing to believe. He said all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Will you go? Will you believe? Will you cooperate with me? Come on. Let's start dreaming. Let's start getting a vision. Let's start planning big. You You need to look around. You need to see what area God set you in. What's your area of influence? You're going to have to be willing to hug the cross and lay down your life. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to be willing to, to run through the troop of fear and intimidation of men. You have to begin to fully exercise the divine authority that's been given to you and recognize that Satan is paralyzed. The moment you begin to speak, he goes completely paralyzed. He can't do his work. As long as you keep your mouth shut and you're intimidated by his lies, he's active. He's at, he, he has authority. As soon as you say, no more will you push me down. No more will you hinder me. No more will you keep my mouth shut. There are people come into this place and I watch them. They don't really enter into praise and worship. Their mouth is closed. And it's a manifestation of how you live. Everything about our life is a manifestation of how we live. We can't open up our mouth and begin to boldly proclaim these things that the Lord Satan has put a gag order on us. Mm. Meanwhile, he begins to influence the culture and the society around us to the point that now it's written in law right now here in this state. Transgender bathrooms for elementary school kids. It just goes, it goes on and on and on. Unbelievable state. What are we doing here? Somebody's going to have to start moving. Somebody's going to have to start recognizing this ain't about the legislative and judicial system of men. This is about dealing with principalities and spiritual wickedness. It's about a church that's abdicated its position of power and authority. And the church needs to have revival. And the first part of revival is where God's people begin to consecrate themselves 
to live only for Him, to no longer allow the powers and the influence of a satanic realm to take control and authority over their life and mandate to them their iniquity. God set you free. You've clean escaped, completely escaped. All that Satan has purposed to do, destroy your soul. Now rise up. Now rise up in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Now rise up in Jesus' name. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.